Thelma, what gave you the idea to start Charleford House? Now, I was bringing home women who were too sick to put back in the situation that they had left, keeping them overnight and sometimes two, three days because I had a spare bedroom in a converted store apartment that I lived in. So lo and behold, it took a whole summer actually of 1969, the house was obtained and uh, financed by the social worker of First United Church, but it just solved all of my problems and gave me a whole bunch of new ones. I gave up my apartment and so on and, and moved into this house. No occupants from the 1st of October till the 10th. The same social worker from First United had sent me a girl who I already knew, and she knew me and she was willing to come. And that was my first client. She passed away some years later, a number of years later. She had cancer and uh, but she passed away sober. Where was the first house? Oh, 7220 Charleford. That's where we got our name. Charleford Street is a little one block long street out in South Burnaby. It uh, proved to be quite adequate when we got it straightened around. There was a great deal of straightening to do. Eventually got it so that it did run. You know, there were ladies who stayed sober. You mentioned First United Church as being important in those first days. Were there other supporters? Like, was there government funding then? Or? Uh, after a year, Grace McCarthy, through her, we got $300 a month. But it was not to be used for wages. I really don't know where we were to get our wages from. But then we were dedicated and we really didn't need any wages, you know. That was sarcasm. Because, <laughs> now, well, in your time off, you have to live somewhere, so where do you live? The first couple of years, I didn't have that to worry about because I lived there. And then uh, they got me a helper, the same social worker at First United had given me the money to get this car, second hand, of course, or third hand. She had given it to me on the condition that I not tell anyone where I got it. And I said, oh, well, I have to tell Lauren. And she said, all right, you can tell him, but make it clear to him that uh, it's not to be anyone else to know. So I did, and uh, everything was fine as far as, and no one else was to drive it. Then we had a, a change of government. We had the good times rolled for a while. The, uh, we got a, a decent amount of money to run the house on, and I acquired a partner in, uh, that she came in one week and I came in the next week. And it worked beautifully for us. When you're doing something you love, you don't care how many hours you put in a day or what you have to give up. You just do. And that was the way it was with Jen and I. She was as devoted to the house as I was. Was there support from the local AA community? Was that part of the support as well, Thelma? Uh, yes and no. The, uh, the old timers, I'm afraid to say, didn't give me support. They uh, felt that it's being tried. You know, we had a house, it went belly up. Another one said, it won't work. They don't stay sober. You, they, come in and you can't force them to stay sober. Nobody ever tried. I mean, if a person wasn't willing and didn't 
want what we had, well then they could go. And I let them know that right at the beginning, that uh, you're in no way forced to stay here. It's not a jail, it's a recovery home. With some of them, they appreciated the value of that, and others didn't. So, and they went back out and drank again, of course. What a typical day was like. A typical day was, the newer ladies didn't wish to say anything, but they listened. And uh, sometimes after two or three months, they actually heard. I remember one lady who said to me, Thumma, I think you know what you're talking about, but I don't have a clue. <laughs> And I said, oh, well, dear, you just keep listening and you will eventually know. And at three months, she said, I know what you're talking about. She became a very dear friend to all of us. Anyway, then after uh, our meeting was over, everyone was free to do their chores, which consisted of making their beds and tidying their rooms and each one had a chore to to do vacuum or take the garbage out or whatever. In the afternoon everyone was free to read books, do whatever they chose. There were usually two people assigned for cooking dinner and uh, once we had our dinner and the dishes cleared and everything we all got ready to go to a meeting. As I said earlier, I had been supplied with a car. Gas was 43 cents. <laughs> Not a liter, a gallon, yes. A lady who was paying cash for herself, and that was a big help. We didn't have to go through the government for that, otherwise we were the girls that were on welfare after we once established that we were a halfway house, uh, recovery home, whatever you'd want to call it. it. It did happen. I mean, it was so much thanks to our first lady had come to me through this lady at the United Church. And this was 1969, 1970. I think I had got raised to $125 a month, and most of that I put back into the house. We changed governments and were given more funding. They told us if we didn't use all of it, we had to refund the other, and so we were told by the secretary to buy things anyway, to use up all this money. Things went quite well, and the women came, and. Some went and some stayed. We moved to Kitchener Street and that was a joyous day. Vivian was charged with stealing a steak and she had stolen it. And it was several months we got a notice that she was to go to court. That was fine. I went with her. The young fellow who had caused her to be arrested, he'd seen her steal the steak, said, oh no, that isn't the woman. They said, yes. No, it isn't. She was sober about four months then, but oh, the change in her came out a couple times and helped me with my husband when he was ill. It's people like that that, you know, I love to remember. The magistrate just said, you know, it's out. He said, there's no, no case here, whatever, and threw it out. We've had a lady be in there, and, and considerably wealthy woman, and she really had everything going for her. And she went back, went home, was drinking, and was killed on her way back, you know, and it was just 
just such a waste and such a tragedy. The women certainly felt it. All you can say is this too can happen to you. Why don't you tell us about your favorite Charlford moment or moments, because I'm sure there were many. We had a rule at the house. If you drink, you must not come back. And I had a very personal tragedy where a sister-in-law and favorite niece were killed in a car accident out in Surrey. So that shook the whole house up for a while. And a couple of the gals went out and drank over it. But other than that, you know, things ran quite smoothly. Good big moments were Christmas time. Loved Christmas. And that was when the community, the AA community, did give me support. Christmas was just a joy. Everybody that came in, you know, were quite happy. We let their families come if they had children. It was a joy. And I'm 84 now, so. And oh my, to know what I know now, which is totally impossible, but I'm not that knowledgeable yet. I sure know a lot more than I did then, but it's the greatest years of my life. And the ladies that I've met, so many of them have become such dear friends. I'm so grateful to many, many of the women that have known the joys and the sorrows of Charlford House.